for the opportunity to do just that. You're gracious to us. Uh, Lord, may I decrease that you might increase. In Christ's name we pray. May the people of God say amen. 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 If you don't mind uh, standing with me, we're going <clears> to <throat> read the Word of God together. <coughs> Excuse me. And take out your Bible. We're going to go to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading in in verse 15, read down to verse 23. Luke chapter 14, verse 15 through 23. If you have it, can you say amen? amen? When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've I've bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Come out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and blind and lame. The servant said, Sir, what you command that had been done has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Can you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. Now, we're in, we're in the second week of our series for the one, and the idea is indeed the, a person um, that you may have on your heart and your mind that you know, obviously, Christ wants to save, and you want to be part of that process. And so someone that needs that invitation to be at the house of God. Not that they have to be in the house of God to come to know Jesus Christ, but for many of us, for most people, that's the starting place. And so that, that heart, that desire to invite the one, it's based on Matthew 18, where the scripture says a man had a hundred sheep, one, one ran off, he left the 99 that he may go after the one. And, and today I want to talk about making that invitation, what it means to make that invitation, being the person who's willing to make that invite. And I know, you know, when we're dealing with masses of people, we have various varied personalities, obviously. Some people are very much extroverts. And for them to, to make an invitation or to talk to people is not very hard. There's some of us who, uh, who never meet a stranger. We can talk to someone, whether we're standing in line, whether we're sitting at a table, uh, some, some of us uh, can have a waiter come wait at the table, and by the time that waiter's finished, I know our daddy's name or mama's name, how many children uh, they got, uh, how long they've been in Yuma, et cetera, et cetera. Some people are not, it's not hard. There's the few of us that can talk to a loaf of bread on the grocery store aisle until a live body comes along and then decide, okay, I'll talk to that person since they're moving, right? So I know that, you know, not everybody's the same. When I, when I was, um, it, it was, it's always been easy for me when I was, uh, before I even started the church, now we're talking in the early 90s, this church started in 1993. I would walk, I would walk the streets on the north end where I lived, and w- when people passed by, I would say hello and see if I could strike up a conversation, ask them if they wanted prayer or if they go to a church, there was even seasons and periods when I would go door to door and just knock on the door, cold call, and just people open the door, hey, my name is Tyrone Jones, I know you don't know me, uh, but I'm just here to say, hey, uh, I want to ask you if you want prayer, is there anything I can do for you? So I get that. I'm certainly knowing that, and, and th- that was 1993. I probably wouldn't try that in 2022. Uh, there's just a little bit different response at people's doors nowadays. You know, now I'd probably hear sick them, you know, if I, you know, <laughs> knocked on the door and they opened it up and didn't know me and I'm cold calling them. But so, but I get it. Extroverts don't, don't really mind 
introverts, you know, you, it, 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 it's, it's a little harder for you to kind of uh, think about going beyond that comfort zone to, to just invite people, especially people you may not know. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, about that. But here's the thing, though, that, I, that I'm sure all of you are aware of. Everybody that's sitting in this room, someone made some kind of invitation to you. It might have been an invitation straight to, to the throne of grace to know Jesus. It might have been an invitation to a small group. It might have been an invitation to a church service. But everybody here received some kind of invitation uh, to, to be in a place where you can know more uh, about, about our Lord. And, and that's, that's the same thing for us. We are people that are called to invite. We're called to extend ourselves beyond ourselves so that people may come to the same place, same knowledge of the Lord that we, that we have. So the goal of this kind of today is just to kind of give you a framework of what that invitation looks like. And, and the main idea of that is that, you know, we're the ones who are called to make the invitation. That's what we see uh, in the Scripture. Jesus did put this back on us. Everything in the kingdom of God is prepared and made ready, which we'll deal with in a little bit more details. But now the invitation, how do people know that everything has been prepared? How do they know about a Savior? How do they know about Christ? How do they know that there's a safe place where they can, they can really hear real things about their life and, and have their life realigned uh, in line with the God who created them? And for me, <clears throat> the reason it's always been second nature to invite people to the church, house of God, gatherings, the reason it's always been second nature is because I know what I'm inviting them to. I know what I'm inviting them to. I know to whom that invitation leads to. And yes, obviously it goes to a, through a house of God or through some kind of gathering. But, but I know what I'm, what I'm inviting people to. I know uh, what I'm inviting people out of. And I know that I have a part to play. And so that's kind of what you see Jesus doing here in Luke chapter 14. Uh, the, the, the narrative of this, if you started at the beginning, Jesus is invited to be at some Pharisee's house, some religious leader's house. It wasn't uncommon for them to invite Jesus to, to be around them. Some of it, most of it, I think, there's a couple we can read in Scripture that might have had some real, true, sincere desires to want to hear from Jesus. But most of the time when you read about Jesus and the invite from the religious leaders, it's usually because they're, they're trying to trap him or trying to trick him or trying to get him into a position to where they can accuse him of either violating the law or doing something against what their, what their traditions or practices were. This, this particular situation was no different. Here on this particular setting, they bring Jesus to this place, and they ask Jesus the question, well, is it lawful for a man to heal on the Sabbath? Now, the reason they're asking Jesus that is because Jesus was healing. Jesus didn't care what day of the week it was. And matter of fact, if you're hurting, you are not going to be hurting on Saturday and thinking, man, I'm not going to make it, but shoot, it's the Sabbath. I don't think I can get healed today. I hope I make it till tomorrow. If you're the one that need healing, you ain't thinking about whether it's the Sabbath day or not. And neither was Jesus. Jesus went about doing his, his healing. So they said, is it lawful for, for you to heal on the Sabbath? Jewish culture, seventh day of the week is the day of rest. People don't even walk very far. They, they do all their meals on Friday nights so they don't have to cook on Saturday. I mean, they do everything where Saturday is absolutely a rest day. For some reason or other, healing was included in this working well, Jesus didn't answer that question directly. He actually come out at another angle, and he said this. If it so happened that one of your oxen fell into a hole on the Sabbath day, would you go get the oxen out? Well, of course they would, because that's their livelihood. That's what they count on. You know, that, that would be like your car going into a ditch, and you say, well, I don't really need the car till Sunday, so I'll just let it stay in the ditch on Saturday after all. It is the Sabbath day. No, no, no. That's, that's your livelihood. And so once Jesus asked that question, they didn't have anything to say. 
But then Jesus opened up a dialogue by saying to them, now I've noticed that, and this is later on in the chapter, he says, I've noticed that when you have feasts and banquets like this, and it wasn't a particular banquet, like there wasn't just celebrating things. If you've done any travel to the Uh, to the Eastern culture, they just fix lots of food and just invite lots of people to eat with them. It's just common practice for them. And so Jesus says, I noticed though, when you do invite people to come eat with you, that oftentimes everybody who comes feels like they're special. And that's still true even today. Everybody who gets an invite feels like they're special. Oh, Tyrone and Virginia invited us to their home. They feel special about that. But he says, I noticed that when they come, They all want to try to sit in the best seats. And Jesus says, I'm just thinking, first of all, he said, uh, those who do that, you you know, you may not want to do that because the the guy who invited people to the house, he may want somebody else to sit in the seat closer to him, and then you'll be humiliated having to go back to another seat. So, So he talked about exalting ourselves and being humble. But then he went into this uh, discourse after a man said this. Jesus said this, why don't you, when you invite people, why don't you invite poor people and people that are lame and people that are blind and people who can't necessarily do the same to you, make an invitation for you? Why don't you invite them? When, When that was said, a guy that was there with them said, man, won't it be great when we're all together feasting at the, in the kingdom of God, at the banquet of the kingdom of God. Jesus launched off of that to give us this whole understanding of what our purpose is in the inviting. Now, the kingdom of God was, was just this. Every, when Christ came, he ushered in God's kingdom. I want you to understand this. It was never God's intention for people just to live in, in the Garden of Eden, And it certainly wasn't God's intention for us to live in a life like we live it now. There is a place that's been prepared for us. There is a place beyond here, beyond earth, a place that the Lord has prepared for us that is a place of no death and a place of no disease and a place of no heartbreak and no hurt and no pain where people don't lie to you, people don't steal from you, people don't cheat you. There there is a place that the Lord has prepared for us where God, the one God, is the ruler, the majestic one. There's only one person on that throne, and that's our God. That is the kingdom of God. All of us are on that journey that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. A, we're already in the kingdom of God because you've already accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Therefore, you're already part of the kingdom of God, and we're all heading toward that great banquet, the kingdom of God banquet, where all of us that are one family, one people, have one God, one ruler that we commune together with and worship with together forever. Can you say amen? That's the kingdom of God. And What Jesus wanted them to know when that guy said that is basically saying to the dude, you're absolutely correct. People need to be invited to experience this kingdom that you know well about. And he says that, he said, he leads into this illustration of what takes place or what should take place in this kingdom. And it is something, obviously, people, if there's anything you ought to have a fear of missing out on, it ought to be the kingdom of God. But he said, it's up to us. Jesus said, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is here. When Jesus came into, uh, came on, on the earth after 30 years, he started launching out in year 31, year 30, and started telling people, hey, the kingdom of God is here. Because the whole idea of the kingdom being ushered in comes through the Messiah. So Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is now here. Why? Because the Messiah is here. And everything has been prepared. Now it's time to invite people into this kingdom. But Jesus said, notice what takes place, what's taken place. A man prepared a great banquet. He used an illustration, a a parable to show this, illustrating what's happening now in his culture. A man has prepared a great banquet, and he's invited everyone to come in. They knew the banquet was coming. They was anticipating the banquet coming. All of the Jewish people knew once the Messiah came, then the kingdom of God was being ushered in. 
All that's taken place. Jesus is here, and it's now time for people to come into the kingdom of God, and they got excuses. It says, a man has a great banquet feast prepared, and one says, man, I've got some ox. I got to go, I got to go deal with those ox. Another one says, I, I just got a field, man. I got to go try out my field. Another one said, I just got married, and I can't come. They knew the kingdom of God was ushered in. They knew the kingdom was coming. Here's the, the cry of the people was that we would go into the kingdom that's prepared for us. And now that the time has come that their life can absolutely be changed because of the kingdom of God, they got all kind of excuses on why they cannot accept that invitation. Now, he spoke about it in that culture, in the agricultural, but it's the, it's the same with us. People still make excuses. Kingdom of God is now here. Jesus Christ has come. He's died on the cross. He's rose again that every one of us may be forgiven. And the promise to everyone who receives him is that you will have eternal life and be in the kingdom of God forever. And we still hear people making excuses. I get it, man. I, I know that there's an opportunity. I know this can be good for me. I know you've been inviting me to church. And one of these days I'll get there as soon as I get my career together. I know, I know it's probably good for me to change my life, but man, as soon as I can just do a little bit more with raising up my kids, I can focus in on that. As soon as I get this business going in the direction that I want it to go, man, I can give more time to that. People still making excuses when we invite people. But, but here's the thing that I want you to get. Don't take it personal. The invitation still needs to go out. People still need to hear from you that there is a kingdom for them. There is eternity for them. There is a place where they can come and learn about the God of heaven that we call the house of God. And people will make excuses. You hear it. But you don't stop, you don't stop inviting because people make excuses. Because we learn not to take that personal because it's not my banquet. They're not rejecting me. It's, it's not for me to take it personal. It, we're making an invitation for them to come to the house of God so they can hear about the kingdom of God that's prepared for them. And people will make excuses, but we don't take it personal. We keep on making the invitation because you've discovered in your life that is better in his kingdom than your own. It's better with the life that he gives us than the one you try to create yourself. The promises of God are still yes and amen when men will still lie to you and not keep their promises. It's better in his kingdom. Am I talking to the right church? It's better in his kingdom. You know that it's better. And so you should have a desire for people to want to be in the place where you know that the Spirit of God is blessing you. And why, is it, why should it be easy for us to do that? because we know what we're inviting people into. There, there is a difference in invitations. Not all invitations is good. Not all invitations is good. It, it's, it's, it's one thing to get an invitation for you to go to Hawaii with all expenses paid. That's a great, that's a great invitation. It's another invitation for my doctor to come and listen to a lecture and a preview on new technology for biopsies when you got prostate cancer. Yeah, um, all, all men, only men go through that, right? How about colonoscopy? There you go. A whole invite for a whole new procedure on how to see what's going on with co whole different type of invitation. I know what I'm inviting people into. I'm inviting people into the grace of God. I'm inviting people into the goodness of God. I'm inviting people into forgiveness. I'm inviting people into an arena where the promises of God are on their life. You're inviting people into a place of light. You're inviting people into nothing but good. There should never be a concern about inviting people into something that you know is good. Who would you invite and say, man, listen, I'm going to invite you into mercy, but I'm just not so sure it's good for you. I'm going to invite you into forgiveness, but if you think that's something that will work for you, I'm going to invite you to grace. 
if you think grace is good. You know it's good. So we know what we're inviting people into. At the same time, I know what I'm inviting people out of. I know what I'm inviting them out of. I know that I'm inviting them out of darkness into light. I know I'm inviting them out of depression into a joy that's full. I know I'm inviting them out of despair into peace that's beyond all understanding. I know what I'm inviting them out of. A life of unknown, a life of fear, a life of uncertainty, a life of ups and downs. I know what I'm inviting them out of, and I know what I'm inviting them into. That's why the invitation ought to be easy. Because you see people, you run across people, you work with people, you live with people who you know are living in darkness, and they need light. Could be in your home, could be your next door neighbor, could be on your job, could be in in, in your business, could be the person that you hang out with at the dog park or the person you play baseball with. You know that there's people who need to come out of darkness into light. And Jesus says, you have the invitation. You got the invitation. Now, the scripture says that this, when we talk about coming out of darkness into light. Actually, in, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus rehearses what he's calling us into. He says, uh, 11, 28, and 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I'm lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's something all of us can hear because none of us was born into this true relationship with Jesus. We might have been born in a Christian home, but none of us was born again until we met Jesus Christ. We understand what it means to be tired and what it means to be worn out. We understand what it means to be burned out on, on, on religion. And Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm calling you to get away from that kind of life and recover a life that I, had, that I have prepared for you, to get a real rest for your souls, a real rest, to walk with Jesus and to learn from Jesus, to learn how to live in those unforced rhythms of grace. Jesus says, what I'm going to give you, it's not going to be hard. It's not going to be hard. As a matter of fact, it's my yoke. I'm going to keep company with you. I'm going to teach you how to learn how to live this life freely and lightly. That's the invitation that he's taken us, that we're being invited to. And then out of, he's calling us out of that darkness. First Peter 2, 9 says there's a complete change that takes place. Listen to this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. I love this language. People can say all kinds of things about you and, and badmouth you and, and call you this and, and say you that. But when you know Jesus Christ, you can respond and say, Let, you can say all you want, but I know this, I'm chosen. You, you can mock me and ridicule me all you want, but I'm going to tell you this, I'm royal. The Bible says I'm royal priesthood. I'm of a holy nation. I have been possessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that has his hands upon us and his arms are wrapped around us. And that's why we proclaim the praises of the Lord. That's why we sing the songs that we sing. That's why we rejoice the way that we rejoice. That's why we're so excited to be in the house of God with everybody else, because we get to stand together with everybody else who knows what it's like to be called out of darkness into this marvelous light, and we get to worship together. Can you say amen? Amen. And so there's a part now, since that's what he's done, we know what we've been called into, we know what we've been called out of, There's, there's a part that we, there's a part that we play. There's a part that we play. There's an inv- invitation. There's an there's a, there's a, a acceptance of us on our, on our end. Fellas, why don't you come? For us to, to help people to get to this place because we're, we're inviting people to something bigger, something bigger than us, something beyond us. We get to partner with Jesus 
to help bring people to the table. And, and notice what Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew 4, 19. He said this to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's what Jesus said. Immediately after those disciples accepted that invitation of following Jesus, he says, now I want to make you fishers. You're, you're on an assignment, and your job is to reach other people. Because as we read in the parable, Jesus said, here is the intent. I want my house to be full. I want my house to be full. Can I just say this? If Jesus is not satisfied with empty seats, neither should we be. If, if Jesus is saying, there's more people out there that need me. Now, can I just tell you this? You're wondering about when the return of the Lord is coming. Here we go. Tyrone P. Jones is going to give you some heresy live on international TV. I'm going to tell you right now when the return of the Lord is going to come, when every people group around the world hears the gospel and everyone who's coming to Jesus Christ comes. As you know, you're sitting here, we're not gone yet. We're not gone yet. So that means there's still people out there that Jesus is saying, I want my table, to, I want my house to be full. I want my house full. And so for us, it's not a matter of just simply coming to church and being part of the number, but we're stepping into purpose. We're stepping into that desire to invite people, people who might be caught up in all kind of dead religion. When we, when we lose that passion to let other people know about this Jesus and invite them to the house of God, then we've just become part of the dead religion like everyone else. Nothing is more exciting in church than when you invite somebody to come with you that comes with you and stands with you, that sits there with you. There's nothing more exciting. Every week, you can hear stories here. We, we, oftentimes, we illustrate them in baptism. You can hear story, stories here. You always notice the tone of those testimonies. There's probably pages that people write. They get that thing down to, to about 90 seconds, and people tell you what their life was like before they got that invitation. Then they get that invitation, and they surrender their life to Jesus, and then they tell you what, that li what their life is like ever since. We, 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 we do a great job. There's so many transformation stories that are sitting around you, people that are, that are coming. And, and some, everybody that comes, everybody that comes has, has, a, has, a, has a great story. You, you, you get one that comes who's, who's heard the call of God, and indeed, they receive God's grace. And, and now they're sitting at the table right next to you. I, I guarantee you, there's somebody sitting at the table next to you who, who heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who heard that there was a safe place for them to come. In all of their messed up stuff, in all their messed up stuff of life, they said this is a place where people have love and people will show you true love. And the grace of God is waiting for you. And you find those folks that are sitting in CTC that are at the table because somebody invited them. And, and then you have those folks who come along who also has experienced the grace of God. And then, and then they're, they're growing. They've, 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 they've had some grace. And now they're starting to grow, and, and they're now sitting at the table. So we got some grace people at the table. We got some growing people that are sitting in the house, in the house of the Lord. And then we have those people who've went from grace. They've received grace, still living in grace, of course, growing. But they also become very fruitful, producing in the house of God, doing, doing a great job going from this place of just coming out of nothing and being convinced about Jesus to growing and becoming a real disciple, and now the light, salt and light of Jesus Christ is shining through them, and now they're producing fruit. And these are the folks that we eventually end up putting in leadership because they're fruit producers. And, and you may look at this, you may look at this table, and you say, well, pastor, we're doing pretty good. I mean, we got, we can only hold four people at the table. And, and we got three. We're, 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 doing, we're doing pretty good. And you know, that's where a lot of churches get to. I mean, meeting budget, buying property, growing, look at people's lives are changing, and we're, we're, we're doing fine. But I'm telling you what Jesus said. There's still a seat, folks. There's still a seat. There's somebody who belongs at this seat who you know 
who you know. There's somebody who belongs in this seat who they're on your mind every single day. You might live in the house with them. You might work with them. It, it, maybe, maybe it's the person who, who you ran into at the coffee shop and they were having a bad day and, and it was the person who was giving you the barista every day and you're thinking, well, hopefully next time when I go, that person wasn't there. I'm saying Jesus is saying that's probably the person who belongs in the seat. There, there's somebody who still belongs here. Now, let me, let me just tell you this. I know for a fact, and I hope all of y'all can see me, I know for a fact that there's folks who belong in this seat who got some different lifestyles than what we're a little bit used to in Christianity. A little bit different lifestyle. We, we got some folks who belong in this seat who actually probably would, would, would fill in the blanks very well in the book of Hosea when we talk about Gomer and the prostitute. Or people who have some alternative lifestyles that we know doesn't line up with Christian values. And, and, and maybe you're thinking, you know, I'll go ahead and invite, man, everybody knows Jermaine. He's had some rough lumps in life, but I know he belongs to church, so I'm just going to invite him. And, and I'm, I'll go ahead and invite Devin. You know, he's, he's a growing guy and a good young man and looking for a wife. I don't know if I should say that on national TV, <laughs> looking, looking for a wife. Uh, you know, we got, some, we got some hot chicks at CTC. Yeah, I'll, I'll invite Devin. He, he'll probably fit right in. And we got Derek here who, who can preach the paint off the walls. He's a great guy. We, we know we'll invite him. But, but you mean that? You mean that that person who has a lifestyle that I just wouldn't be comfortable with? I, if I wouldn't be comfortable with living with them next door, I, I don't know if I'd be comfortable with them sitting next to me in church. I, I don't know if, if I'd be comfortable with them. I, I just, I don't know if I can go after that one. I mean, what, what would my friends think if I bring that person to church and the people in church say, that's who you're hanging around with? You, you know, birds, bird, you know, birds that flock together, all that kind of nonsense. With, how's it go? You, you end up flocking with the birds that you're together with, something like that. You know, you know how it goes. Two peas in the pod. Well, I'll just, uh, yeah. You, you get it. Just run the forest gum. But... But, but you guys get the point. And, and can I, let, let me just tell you something. The, these folks, they're not always easy to deal with. If, if you think it's hard to invite them, it's, it's not easy with them to get them to change. Because there are some things that we know is good for them. And you try to feed them good doctrine. This is going to be good for your life. And, well, I want to go to church, but pff, don't give me that Bible. Well, you just said I, I'm accepted here, but pfft, you're not accepting me. You, you're trying to feed them love. You're trying to feed them acceptance. You're trying to feed them grace and, and tell them Jesus has a better plan for, for their life. And you want to help them, but pfft, pfft, pfft. don't want that. And, and can I also say this? Just like we may have some thoughts about the person who should be in this table, they got some thoughts about you. They got some thoughts about you. Because the person who belongs in this seat, they're actually sitting at home every Saturday waiting for their best friend to call them, to bring them to church. But they don't get the call. And you know what they end up thinking? Because they don't want to be seen with me. They... they it's okay for them to, for us to go out to, to the ball games together and watch high school football because after all, it's their son, and so I'm the friend, but they, but they, don't, wanna, they don't want me around them at church. This, this seat needs to be filled. This seat needs to be somebody who knows acceptance. Jesus said this, when, when he told them to go out and fill that place up, they said, we've done all that. We went and got the maim and the blind, and we, we got them all. And, and, and he said, what, what's the status? He said, the place is still not filled. He said, then you go back out there. You go back out there because we're not done until this seat to this person who belongs in this seat, who's your daughter, who's going through all kinds of sexual stuff. She needs to be sitting here. Your mother who raised you with your father, and now all of a sudden she's living with another woman. She needs to be sitting here. 
the person that you had to kick out of school because they kept slinging dope. They need to be sitting here. They need to be sitting there. That seat belongs to somebody that Jesus said is for you to make that invitation because the, the table has room for them. The table has room for them. Now, here's the practical thing. Here's the practical thing. I've given you a card there, and hopefully you got a pen. There's people that's on your heart and mind that you know you need to invite. You need to write those folks down, and you pray over this card all week of making that invitation, whether it be for next Sunday or whether it be for Easter Sunday. You, you pray. You write those folks down. You know who they are. They need to be here. They need to be in the house of God. They need to be in a place where their life is transformed. I don't care who it is, you write that person down. One of them might be a long shot, a person who you think, I haven't even spoke to them, but they keep coming on my mind. They need to be, they need to get the invitation. They need to get the invitation. Now, let me just close with this. In John chapter 4, and team, you can come. In John chapter 4, Jesus was with the disciples, and they were heading can't remember where they were going, but they stopped near Samaria. And there was a well there. And when they got there, Jesus said to his disciples, I'm hungry and I'm tired and I'm thirsty. He sent the disciples into town to go get food or they went into town to go get food. While Jesus was there, noon part of the day, here comes a woman carrying a water pot. The reason that woman was coming at noon, because all women went to get water from the well early in the morning to supply for their home throughout the day. They went in as a community. They gathered at the well together. They helped one another. But this woman was known as a woman that had given herself to several men, married five times that Jesus has has told her. She comes at the well that because she can't be a part of the rest of the group. She's not accepted. People mocked her and ostracized her. She can't be with the rest of the company, but she comes at noon. When she gets there, Jesus is there, and Jesus says, can you give me something to drink? The woman said, listen, I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. You don't even talk to us. You don't even talk to us. And Jesus says, listen, if you knew who I was, you will ask me for water, and you have water that will be everlasting everlasting water. She says, I get it, I get it, I get it. I know the Messiah's coming. And and one of these days, I'll be able to go to the place. Listen to what she says. One of these days, I'll be able to go to the place where they let people like me worship the Messiah. One of these days, I'll get an invitation to go where the Messiah is. One of these days, they'll let me in. Jesus says, I'm the Messiah the one you're speaking to. And I'm telling you, if you listen to the words that I'm telling you, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. You will bubble up into eternal life. The disciples show up. They see Jesus talking to this woman. When the disciples show up, she runs off and goes, makes an invitation in the city. Come and see a man who told me everything about my life. He is the Messiah. He spoke with me. He told me that I'm accepted by him. Come see this man. The disciples come back and see Jesus talking to the woman and say, what is, what is up with him? Not only is he tired and hungry, he's delusional. He knows we don't talk to those folks. They go on, lay out the food and said to Jesus, here's everything laid out. Why don't you come and eat? And Jesus says, I don't need to eat. My food is doing the will of my Father. Can I tell you something? Because that third application, besides besides you you, uh, praying, writing down who who it is you need to invite and praying for them, that that you have the courage to make the invitation. The other thing is this, have, allow God to put you in a Holy Spirit moment one of those divine moments at that very time when you think you're just at the store getting broccoli and somebody is there and you build a conversation with and the next thing you know, the person that you're picking out broccoli with hears you talk about Jesus and decides, I think I want that life too. 
You, you think you're just going to order coffee, and it's that very barista that Jesus is saying, today, watch him ask you a question that leads you to invite them to the church that you pastor. You, you, you think you're just simply sitting with some other folks at the soccer game, and you get into the conversation of what you do and, and, uh, and what your, what, how's your family and how big is your family. And next thing you know, you, you're telling them, you know, my family is this. And I got five children and eight children now. Sorry, if skip three. Got eight children now. And, uh, and, and, and what my life is like, man, I just love to talk to people just like you and tell them how life can be better. And that very person ends up coming to church and being baptized on the screen because of divine moment. See, here, here's what, when we read the story about Jesus and the woman at the well, we think Jesus was there for the water. He wasn't there for the water. He was there for the woman. He was there for the woman. The woman that thought she could never be invited to be included in anything godly. And Jesus was there for her. Who's the one for you? Who's the one for you? for you. I hope their name is on that paper, on that card. I hope they're running across your mind. I hope you pray for them and have the courage to invite them to be, have that seat that's at the table. You know, I got, I got people in this city, every time I see them, every time I see them, they know, they know I'm going to invite them to church. They say, I know, I know. And you know what I tell them? Although it's not always true, but you know what I tell them? Man, that seat next to me in Virginia is still waiting for you. Because I'm telling you right now, whoever walks into this house, we got room for it. We got room for it. Everybody stand if you would. Praise team if you'll come. It's for the one. There's room at the table for the one. The altars will be open. You can come for prayer for whatever you need. I, I just want to pray for us to go after that one, and I'll just miss you. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to be in the house, to hear your word, to know, Lord God, what your promises are for us as a people. And Lord, I pray that what we've been hearing about that invite, about that one at the table, that every one of us, we got someone, Lord God, who you've placed on our mind and heart. Lord, may we commit to praying. May we ask you for the courage to make that invitation so that that seat that's made for them will be filled. It will be filled. Father, we want your house to be full. Thank you for allowing us to be part of the role to helping you expand and grow the kingdom of God. Let us do it with passion. Let us do it with diligence. Let us do it in faith. In Christ's name we pray. May the people of God say amen. God bless you.